our strategy to understand mechanical quantities remains the same. First, we start by considering standard mechanical quantities, where the exponents x and y are small integers. We'll come back to this assumption at the end of this series, but for now it allows us to deal with a reasonable amount of players. Today, as in the previous episodes, we will only consider pairs of mechanical quantities. We've established in the previous episode that the ratio of pairs of mechanical quantities yields a kinematic result. This relationship between matter and spacetime can be written as the evolution of a size or distance d, function of the variable time t, and of the mechanical ratio. Although this perspective on the relationship between mechanics and kinematics is just one out of many, it offers quite a visual way to understand motion as the result of the interplay of two mechanical quantities, one impelling motion and the other impeding it. The numerator facilitates motion. It is the motor if you want, while the denominator slows things down. Note that for Q1 to be indeed in the numerator, and so for Q2 to be in the denominator, this means that x1 minus x2 must be positive. Another way to say this is that the motor is always the quantity on the rightmost side. So if paired with Q2, Q1 is the motor. However, the quantity Q1 is not intrinsically a motor, only relatively to Q2. If we were to pair Q1 with a different quantity, Q3, on its right, then Q3 would become the motor, the impelling factor, and Q1 would become the impeding factor. This episode is dedicated to this relativity in the roles played by the mechanical quantities, to the fact that no quantity is always impeding or always impelling. There are no such things as holy motors. Although given a pair, one is always driving, what is driving in one situation can be resisting in another, and vice versa. This fact was clearly not understood when the first few mechanical quantities were defined and to this day it remains the source of a lot of confusion. We only need to look at the hysterical names of the quantities on this table to see that some of them are quite heavily connotated. To the right of the table where they are more likely to be motors, the names are quite clearly positive. Action, energy, force, power, all of these match terms are clearly here to remind us that these quantities were thought as movers. For a lot of early scientists, they were nothing short than the hand of God in the physical world. In contrast, terms like friction, mass, or viscosity were clearly thought of as sticky, gooey, resisting, or at most inert, rather than active. In fact, these quantities can be active, they can be impelling motion rather than impeding it, under the right circumstances. We will see this with viscosity first. We will show a few cases where viscosity is playing its expected role as an impeding factor, and we will then discuss an important example where viscosity is in the driver's seat. In episode 4, when we discuss simple speeds, we saw viscosity paired with surface tension, which for instance governs the pinching of viscous fluids like glycerol or syrup or honey. In that case, viscosity is indeed impeding motion. A higher value of viscosity tends to lower the value of the viscocapillary speed, the evocative name for the ratio between gamma and eta, the surface tension and the viscosity. We know this pair already, so no need to dwell on it. What if a force becomes the motor rather than a surface tension? The difference in the space exponent is 2, and 1 in the time exponents. So the pair force viscosity produces a regime where a size or distance d grows as a square root of time and viscosity is, again, the impeding factor. Can you think of examples of this sort of dynamics? We don't have to go very far to find an instance of this regime. It actually shows up in the realm of droplets and bubbles we've grown accustomed to. For instance, this regime is seen to govern the growth of the neck between two coalescing droplets or bubbles embedded in a much more viscous fluid. The picture here corresponds to two water droplets in silicon oil, with a viscosity about 50 times that of water. In the formula, eta is the viscosity of the outer fluid. The picture comes from a paper by Paulson from 2014. We'll discuss this in a lot more details in the droplet series, but in this context, the impelling factor 
the force is usually written as the product of a surface tension gamma and a size capital D, typically that of the droplets. Given that gamma and F are next to one another on the same line, this substitution is clearly allowed. That was force and viscosity, where viscosity is playing the expected role of bus kill. Let's give one last example of that sort, when viscosity is paired with energy. Here, the interplay of dimensions yield a regime where size is proportional to the cubic root of the time t. An example of this scaling is found in a situation not too far from droplets, but a little bit more exotic. What you are seeing here is a spherical aggregate of cells, which slowly spreads on a flat substrate. And this is what you see from below the transparent substrate. Over the course of a few hours, the area of contact grows, with the cells moving outward. In this context, the size d is the radius of contact, and the viscosity is that of the aggregate of cells. For reason going beyond this episode, the energy is here again, usually written from a surface tension and a size capital D. A strange habit we're getting used to. Capital D is the initial radius of the aggregate, and gamma is understood as the addition energy per unit area between the cells and the substrate. All in all, the dynamics are due to the interplay between an energy and a viscosity, leading to a size growing with time to the power 1 over 3. And viscosity is here again resolutely impeding motion. When paired with energy, or force, or surface tension, viscosity lives up to its name. So much so that it's hard to imagine how it could be any different. And yet, the recipe to switch things up is quite simple. We just need to pair viscosity with the quantity on its left. The most well-known example dates back to the beginning of the 20th century, where researchers concerned with the motion of fluids started to take a closer look at the pair of viscosity and density. With such a duo, there is no doubt viscosity is in control. It is in the numerator. It is now the impaling factor. Certainly, such sacrilege could not be possible. Well, actually, it is possible. As noted by Ludwig Prentl, this simple scaling underlines the structure of flows, like that of water, when we look at what is going on near boundaries. We've encountered a similar setup in episode 3, when we talk about shear in relation to the simple time associated with the ratio of viscosity and stress. At t equals 0, the speed of the boundary is set to a constant value. If there is no slip, we expect the fluid in contact with the moving boundary to start moving as well. However, the fluid sufficiently far away must still be immobile. Imagine that you're moving the wall of a pool. Right at that instant, the fluid say 20 meters away must be immobile, right? Would it still be immobile if the boundary had been moving like this for an hour? How far would have motion spread after such a duration? We expect that as time goes by, motion will progressively spread inside the fluid. The question is how far, after a given time t, how does the thickness of this so-called boundary layer evolve over time? The thickness of the boundary layer is proportional to the square root of time, and the coefficient of proportionality is given by the ratio of the viscosity and density of the fluid. For instance, in water, where the viscosity is 10 to the minus 3 pascal second, and the density is 1000 kg per cubic meter, it would take over 12 years for motion to spread 20 meters. That is, of course, if viscosity and density remain the relevant mechanical quantities during all that time. And you would be right to doubt this. You may have noticed that this scaling does not include the speed of the boundary. No matter the speed, small or large, the boundary layer extends at the same rate. That's pretty weird. This scaling is also valid when the boundary is immobile and the fluid away from it is moving uniformly. The only place where the fluid is deformed is within the boundary layer, where the velocity gradient is non-vanishing. Let's look at results from actual experiments in this configuration, where the fluid is air rather than water. What we are seeing here is the size of the boundary layer over time. Here is the scaling we would expect if the dynamics are solely due to the interplay of viscosity and density. Given that these measurements are 100 years old, the agreement is not that bad. 
These experiments were among the first of this kind, and they have since been reproduced on countless occasions. This particular set of data was obtained for a uniform speed of 4 meters per second, far from the boundary. But the trend was confirmed for other speeds as well. Here is 8 meters per second, 12 meters per second, and 16 meters per second. As surprising as it may be, the extension of the boundary layer is independent of the speed far away from the boundary. It is solely driven by the viscosity and slowed by the density. Well, at least for the time range shown here, that is four times under a second, and boundary layers thinner than a centimeter. What these experiments revealed was that if the initial dynamics of the boundary layer are independent of the flow speed, they certainly depend on this speed after a certain threshold. The greater the flow speed, the sooner the dynamics of the boundary layer depart from the viscosity density regime. Why this departure occurs is a fascinating story, having to do with the transition from a smooth to a turbulent flow. We'll discuss this another time because we will first have to learn how to deal with transitions between regimes, something that we will introduce in an upcoming episode. In any case, we now know a great example where viscosity is the impelling factor, a century-old example that had a tremendous influence on the way we understand flows. Going back even further, there is another example of quantity that was initially thought of solely as an impeding quantity, but which turned out to be just as able to drive motion. This quantity is probably the oldest of them all, and it sits right at the origin of our table. It is the mass. The mass was originally understood as inertial, a world from the beginning of the 18th century based on the adjective inert, in art, without art, without skill, from the Latin inertum, unskilled, incompetent, inactive, helpless, weak, sluggish, worthless, a long list of pretty negative attributes given by the etymological dictionary. That was how mass was initially perceived, as the paradigm of the impeding factor. That was until it was realized that the mass could also be the source of motion in the context of gravity. In the previous episode, we talked about the free fall, but we never actually specified where the force F came from. We just showed that if an object of mass M is driven by a constant force F, its motion is uniformly accelerated. And so the distance D is proportional to the square of the duration T since the motion started from rest. This formula is valid even when the force F has nothing to do with what we commonly call the weight. Any force divided by a mass is an acceleration, A. If a distance is proportional to a time square, the coefficient of proportionality is acceleration. That's sort of a definition. What Galileo had shown was that for every object on Earth, there is a special value of acceleration called g, equals to around 9.8 meters per second square. That is, the speed of a free-falling object increases by around 9.8 meters per second per second. To this day, this value is sometimes used as a unit of acceleration, any acceleration. For instance, when we say that this or that roller coaster pulls out four Gs, which means that it generates an acceleration four times greater than the acceleration we all feel all the time pulling us toward the ground. If we express this acceleration as the ratio of a force and a mass, we get the expression for the weight of an object of mass m. A particular kind of force, one that we get for free just for being on Earth. The origin of this worldwide force troubled generations of thinkers, and is still somewhat of a mystery to this day. A big leap was made by Newton. Newton proposed that although the acceleration g was omnipresent and ubiquitous, it was not actually universal. It was a variable, but depending on immutable factors if one was to remain on the surface of the Earth. It was worldwide, but not universal. What did Newton propose? To build an expression for the acceleration g, Newton proposed to look for hints in the dynamics of objects far away from the surface of the Earth. He reasoned that to understand the provincial value of the acceleration g, one had to make a connection between the falling objects on Earth and the orbiting celestial objects, like the moon around the Earth, or the planets around the Sun. 
From Copernicus to Galileo, orbital motions fascinated thinkers of the Renaissance, as they were discovering more and more about the solar system. Kepler played a big role in this quest to understand the motion of celestial bodies. He meticulously compared the astronomical data with the available models, the geocentric model of the ancient Ptolemy, the heliocentric model of Copernicus, and the geo-heliocentric model of Tycho Brahe, Kepler's master at the beginning of the 17th century. The comparison with the data favored the heliocentric model. Kepler then set out to compare the periods of revolution of the planets with the distance separating them from the Sun. The closer a planet, the faster it revolves around the Sun. The data available at that time were limited, but they were enough to produce a plot like this, representing the characteristics of the orbits of Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. On this plot, the period is measured in years, that is in comparison to the period of revolution of the Earth. Similarly, the distances are measured relatively with respect to the distance from the Earth to the Sun, one astronomical unit in the parlance of our time. Of course, we are free to switch the X and Y axis to represent the distance versus the time of revolution. And a distance versus a time, that's a representation we've grown accustomed to in the previous episode. Obviously, the relationship is not linear, which is to say that the speed of the planets is not constant. The further they are, the slower they move along their orbit. We know what to do, we can represent the same data in log scale. Now the data points align neatly. The relationship between the distance to the Sun and the period of revolution is a parallel. And what is the slope of this parallel? Kepler discovered that it was two-third. It is now known as Kepler's third law of planetary motion, usually written the other way around. Reflecting on this discovery, Kepler wrote, I first believed I was dreaming, but it was absolutely certain and exact that the ratio which exists between the period times of any two planets is precisely the ratio of the three half power of the mean distance. Kepler had deduced this law from the motions of the planets known at his time. The absolute distance between the planets and the Sun were not exactly known, but measuring distances relative to the orbit of the Earth was just as good. Changing the units to say meters and seconds does not change the trend. The slope is still the same. Let's zoom out to accommodate new orbiting bodies. First, let's include Uranus, discovered in 1781, and Neptune, discovered in 1846. They are both where we would expect them to be, on the same trend as the other planets. Anything revolving around the Sun seems to be on this trend. We can also include dwarf planets, Pluto and the like. They all follow Kepler's rule. For these bodies, all orbiting around the Sun, the value of the prefactor K is around 1.5 million meters per second to the power 2 over 3. How can we explain such value? A generation after Galileo and Kepler, Newton's crazy idea was that Kepler's parallel of planetary motion and Galileo's parallel for the freefall down on Earth were intimately connected. They were both manifestations of universal gravity. And so the acceleration g on Earth should be related to the prefactor k in Kepler's law. We've already seen that Newton thought that the acceleration g was not universal, but specific to the Earth. He also had the same approach to Kepler's constant. For Newton, the value of both g and k were set by the world they described. For g, the world was the Earth, and for k, the world was that of the Sun, the solar system. Behind the laws of these two nested provinces, something universal was hiding. It was Galileo who had opened up the possibility for these other worlds, with the discovery of the moons of Jupiter, now called the Galilean moons, or satellites, a name suggested by Kepler. They were named Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, as suggested by their co-discoverer, the German astronomer Simon Marius. These moons were revolving around Jupiter, like the planets around the Sun. And let's see how Kepler's law can be applied to account not just for the motion of planets around the Sun, but also for the motion of the moons around their planets. 
And if we plot the distance versus period for these objects, we find them away from the planetary trend, but following a parallel with the same 2 over 3 slope. So the satellites of Jupiter still follow Kepler's law, but with a different prefactor k, around 10 times lower than for the planetary trend. With the insight of time and the data gathered since the Renaissance, we can add the moons of Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, the two moons of Mars, and of course, the original moon, Mars. All lines are parallel, they all follow the two-thirds scaling. Each line corresponds to a given center around which the objects on that particular line revolve around. For the planets, this center is the Sun, and for the moons, the centers are their respective planets. The challenge is now to understand what sets the value of the prefactor k for each dataset. Given what we've seen in the previous episodes, we know that we could try to understand the kinematic prefactor k as some kind of ratio between mechanical quantities. And this is indeed what Newton accomplished. For each orbital system, planetary or satellite, Newton realized that the prefactor k was connected to the mass of the center of the orbits the horizontal axis on this plot. This mechanical quantity is an intrinsic property of the star or planet under consideration. In contrast, the vertical axis gives the cube of k, which is a kinematic property of all the orbits around the center. For the planets revolving around the sun, just as much as for the moons around their planets, Newton discovered that the cube of k is proportional to the mass m of the center. Note that our presentation is here clearly anachronistic, since the assumed validity of this relationship was historically used as an hypothesis to make the first measurements of the masses of these bodies from the orbital behavior of their satellites. But we'll have to ignore this epistemological subtlety for now. If the kinematic prefactors of Kepler's law are always given by the cubic root of the mass m of the center, then there must be a second mechanical quantity, q2 constant for all orbital systems on this plot. The value of Q2 is around 6, 10 to the 11 kilogram, meter minus 3, second square. And what kind of strange mechanical quantity has such dimensions? Mass multiplied by time square and divided by the cube of a length, it would be here, right in the no man's land of the table of standard mechanical quantities. Some of you have asked why there was not any quantity with positive time exponents. Well, there might be some after all. This one in particular has had a profound impact on physics. We'll leave it nameless for now, but it deserves its own symbol. If paired with a mass, it takes the role of impeding factor, and the mass becomes the motor. The good old mass now drives the dynamics. Kepler's law is the kinematic consequence of considering the association between the mass m at the center of the orbits and this mysterious new mechanical quantity playing here the role of impeding factor. Whereas the mass m can change from one orbital system to another, the other quantity seems to be constant throughout the solar system. It seems to be universal. In this context, the distance d and time t are understood as constant for a particular orbiting object. That is in contrast with most of the examples we've dealt with since the last episode, where we used lower cases symbols for the size, time, and mass. In the previous episode, we discussed a lot of examples where the size or distance d was growing over a continuous time variable t, for instance, in the case of the free fall. Can the couple formed by a mass and the new quantity be expressed from a similar perspective? With this question in mind, we are ready to come back to Newton's program to unify orbital motions and free falls. Newton's great insight was to realize that the motion of the orbiting moon, or of a falling apple, have the same center, the Earth. So the acceleration of gravity g on the surface of the Earth can be related to the prefactor k of Kepler's law with a value set by the mass of the Earth. To unveil this relation, Newton famously connected orbits and freefalls by considering a slightly different kind of freefall, including an initial velocity. 
In this thought experiment, a cannonball is fired at increasingly large speeds, falling further and further away until the initial speed is large enough to put the cannonball in orbit. The kinematics of this situation can be a bit complicated, so we won't get into the details. But we can already sense that the distance d will be progressively converted into the perimeter of an orbit, which is itself proportional to the distance capital D to the center. The distance of free fall turns into the orbital size, when the duration of the fall becomes the orbital period. There is a point where Kepler's law intersects Galileo's law. The symbol of Kepler's law corresponds to the moon. On this strand, there is only one point per orbit. We could also add artificial satellites to this trend, like the International Space Station. On Galileo's side, all the data points correspond to a single falling apple, with distances recorded at successive instants. To be able to reach Newton's conclusion, unifying the two kinds of motion described by Galileo and Kepler, we can anticipate a bit on future episodes and compute the size at which the power laws intersect. At this intersection, the two kinds of length become the same, a constant that we can call L. And similarly, the two kinds of time become the same, a constant that we can call tau. To obtain expressions for the coordinates of this point of intersection, we just need to use L and tau instead of the d's and t's in each power law, and equate both laws. We'll focus on the size, solving the systems of two equations, to get a formula involving the terrestrial constant k for Kepler and g for Galileo. What is the value of this size L at the intersection of what is going on on Earth and in space around Earth? Well, it's about 1400 kilometers. From his thought experiment, Newton knew that there could not be any orbit smaller than the Earth's own size. And indeed, by being more cautious than us and carefully keeping track of all the numerical factors, the one halves, the two pi's, etc., Newton arrived at the conclusion that the intersection of the two regimes is indeed just one numerical factor away from the radius of the Earth r. The characteristic size L from which the two regimes intersect is a bit less than a quarter of the Earth radius. So from the measurements of L around 1400 kilometers, we can deduce that the Earth radius is around 6400 kilometers, which is very close to the accepted standard mean radius. This relationship between the radius of the Earth and Kepler and Galileo's constant is deduced purely from kinematics, from the continuity between free fall and orbital motion. But we've also seen how to express Kepler's constant from the underlying ratio of mechanical quantities. We can then rearrange the equation to express the acceleration g from the mass and size of the Earth and from this mysterious new mechanical constant. We can now return to what Newton originally set out to do, to express the weight of an object from the mass and size of the Earth itself as a special form of gravity. A universal interaction occurring between any two masses, m1 and m2, separated by the distance r. You must be recognizing this formula now. The constant per factor is what is nowadays called capital G, the universal gravitational constant, a notation introduced at the end of the 19th century. We now see the familiar force we learned in school at the end of an audacious quest to unify terrestrial and extraterrestrial motions and we can figure out the value of this constant, capital G, since we know the value of the upside-down G, from the relationship between the prefactors of Kepler's law for orbits around objects of different masses, which gives a gravitational constant, capital G, around 6.6, 10 to the minus 11, kilogram minus 1, meter cube per second square. Capital G is a mechanical quantity, but not a standard one, according to the criteria we set at the beginning of this series. It is the inverse of a standard mechanical quantity, the upside-down g, which we will call levity. The greater it is, the weaker the gravitational interaction. But can it vary like any other mechanical quantity can, from one situation to the next? Or is it solely a universal constant? And why is there nothing in its neighborhood in the table? We won't be able to answer these questions just yet, 
but we will return to them in future videos. Just as for any other mechanical quantity, the way to better understand this levity is to see what comes out of pairing it with other players on this table. If paired with mass, we know we get a scaling where size is proportional to time to the power 2 third. We've seen this with Kepler's law for orbital motions. But we can now discuss an example where g is the size of an object over time, similar to what we saw with the spreading or pinching examples in the previous videos. Pinching will actually give us the right intuition on what is going on here. We have an object of mass m. This mass is its own motor. In the absence of any internal pressure of some sort, the self-gravity of this mass pulls on itself, contracting it until a pinch-off point not unlike what we saw for the pinching of water droplets. Just as in the pinching of fluids, the time t is really the duration left before pinch-off, and d is the size of the mass at this time. To reassure ourselves that we are not mistaken, we can look at this problem from a Newtonian perspective. We have a gravitational force on the left-hand side, and the inertia on the right-hand side. On the left, the force is between m and itself, over a distance d. A mass on each side cancel out. On the right we can use the size d and the time t to estimate the acceleration. Rearranging we indeed get a size proportional to t to the power 2 third, and using the levity instead of the gravitational constant, we get the only possible regime solely due to pairing mass and levity. Just like any other power law, this regime does not depend on the initial size d note of the mass m. But for a given size, we can compute the time it would take to collapse to zero. If we call this time t note, the scaling connecting space and time can be used to obtain an expression for the time to collapse t note. The mass m divided by the cube of the initial size is up to numerical factors the density rho of the initial mass. Then, the time of collapse can be understood as a simple time combining levity and density. And this time is usually called the freefall time, and it plays a key role in the variety of astronomical scenarios, from star formation to star death. Anytime gravity is dominant over internal pressures coming from other forces. A simple time as one would expect, given the relative positions of density and levity in this table. After six episodes, we are starting to understand this chart a bit more. This table is a map recording the trails followed by mankind to understand the world, the sizes of things, durations and recurring periods, to understand motion, motions of all kinds, growing or shrinking at different rates. In and of themselves, the quantities on this table are powerless. None are fundamentally impelling or impeding motion. The roles are assigned in each situation as soon as quantities are taken in pairs. What the viscosity, the mass, and the levity taught us today is that a quantity can be resisting motion one day and driving it the next day. There are no Holley motors. Quantities on the right of this table will more often drive than resist if paired with the other quantities that are named here. But what the story of gravity tells us is that there can be quantities beyond those we tabulated in the first episode, lurking in the blank spots, like levity. This map is what we got, but this mechanical universe is mostly uncharted territory. In the next episodes we will progressively build up the courage to explore this space beyond the confines of the few mechanical quantities that have been defined in the past centuries. The monsters guarding the frontiers are only those we put there ourselves.